And that the audience has doubled. So, <laughs> we're really looking forward to her presentation. But 
you can use this novel and explain really what populism is all about because people misconstrue it. They think that populism is um, they think that populism is specifically either liberal or conservative, and it's really neither. It is essentially just if you're not an incumbent. <laughs> Because, all right, and this image is really way, a good way to think about it. Say I'm, you know, the powerful elite who's been in my position for a while. This is how I would view populism. I would say my allies and the voters are popular. I've got a lot of support. I've obviously been elected. The populist is my opponent and all of his supporters, essentially the masses. And it is, again, um, it's the people against the privilege. And you see it a lot in third party movements or extreme partisanship. Most recently, I'm sure you've all heard of the Tea Party. That is a populist movement. And that's more of the extreme partisanship. And that means like one party or the other. Not, and bipartisan would be like a more moderate and in the middle. And then to show that that would be a more conservative end, Occupy Wall Street on the right or on the left is exactly the same. It's also a populist movement. Um, and again, it's just, it's just got to have that underlying that, you know, there are enough of us now that nobody in power is representing us, and so that's when you'll start to see problems with them some more. Okay. Um, it first started, uh, we first find populism in, around the Civil War, we had a progressive movement forming, or, Okay, the origin of populist movements in the U.S. began around the Civil War. A socialist political movement in support of the working class had begun to form post uh, uh, sorry, post and what had happened was the plantation economy began to be replaced with sharecropping. It resulted in merchants and landowners extorting the sharecroppers. The crop lien system emerged. And that inflated high prices, there were high rates of interest. Uh, the idea that democracy would mean economic independence for the masses was even further threatened by the Industrial Revolution uh, and the monopolies that that would produce. So, okay. Then we had, like, it was around this time that we had the actual People's Party as opposed to Republican or Democrat. That would have been the first time that we had an actual name for a populist party, only this one, it, it would have been, again, more a socialist party. Uh, they formed um, from groups that had just been all over the country, kind of disparate in the sense that everyone had basically been fed up, they just had to come together to form a unified front to fight the same concerns. There were the nice labor, farm organizations, citizens alliances, mine workers unions, um, but by the 1890s, the farmers' politicians were stifled, the party died out, and they had no real representation. So then we get more progressive Republicans, and that leads us into the early 1900s. You have Teddy Roosevelt's election in 1912, where he split from the Republicans, uh, basically said, you know, Taft hasn't gone far enough, I'm going to take it even further. The Democrats don't even know what they're doing. So I'm a bull moose, and I'm going to make a bull moose party. So then we have the Progressive Party. And, okay. Um, the point of that example was that that election was Roosevelt had 27%, Wilson had 42 Taft had 23 and 6% went to the socialist Eugene Debs, who was actually part of the People's Party. But had Taft and Roosevelt come together, Wilson would not have won. But because uh, Roosevelt was like, no, I'm splitting up this party, you're not doing what we want, they both lost. And so what happened there is exactly what happened, or what they hope would happen in the novel when we meet Willie Stark. Because he is, he's got a little bit of clout now because everyone's like, oh man, if we listen to him, our kids would be fine, the school would be built, everything would be fine in our town. You know, he's not such a terrible guy. He wasn't trying to ruin us. He really didn't care. They've kind of got that message now. Well, so, uh, 
the governor running for re-election, Joe Harrison, is going against a guy named McMurphy. And McMurphy is who Willie would have supported, but kind of was like, you're not going far enough, but I'm going to hold your feet to the fire. Well, they think, you know, if we can get in there and convince this guy to run, then maybe he will split the vote and neither of them will win, and our guy will win, and they're all just stupid thinking that some, like, they're gonna fight over who's gonna be the one who can speak for them. That was what they were hoping to do, was split the ticket. And it's, again, we see that uh, with, like, Nader and the Gore election, how if the Green Party had just, or really the Democrats had been more open to the Green Party's platform, he might not have lost that race. But, anyways, so, you see it time and time again, and it's not going away. It's a tactic that people will continue to use. Alright, so the guy on the left, this is the actual man, Huey Pierce Long. That's his signature at the bottom, I just thought it was cool. Uh, and on the, oh wait, alright. Yeah, this is for y'all too, okay. <laughs> That's Willie on the right, and the guy down there in the corner, I really like the older version of the movie that they had because they really tried to, uh, Roderick Crawford, I mean, he looks pretty close to Huey Long. It was, I don't know, they nailed it. But that guy in the corner, that's Tiny Duffy. He is the spy that the machine sends to be like, Willie, you need to run for office against that guy. So again, he, and at this scene right here, this is the point in the novel where Willie is now becoming aware that he's a pawn. And so he loses it on them. And he's like, this man right here, he thinks we're all hicks. He thinks we're all stupid. And so, I mean, and even at one point, he like trips him and he falls into a pile of pig mud. When he got this kid, kind of funny. And so he says, you know what? I'm dropping out of this race. They think we're stupid. I'm going to throw my weight behind McMurphy. I want all of you to throw your weight behind McMurphy. We're all going to campaign and vote for him. And then we'll hold him accountable I'll hold him accountable and I'll string him up just like the rest and then so he gets real colorful and accusatory and so basically it doesn't work and then he is uh, he's successful, McMurphy's elected, Harrison's kicked out and then Willie is just taken off from there. Now he's campaigning. He now sees, okay great, now McMurphy's in there, now I can start complaining about McMurphy and then run against him next time which is what he does. And again, this parallels Huey's life, because Huey also lost his first attempt at running for governor for not exactly the same reason. It was in 24 when he ran, uh, he was running for governor of Louisiana. And like Willie, most, of, if not all, of his supporters were rural voters. And one of the things that was a real problem in Louisiana was there was only 331 miles of road. And I don't know, have any of you ever driven in the country after a storm on a dirt road? Or should I say not driven in the country <laughs> after a storm on a dirt road? I mean, that's what happened. It stormed so bad, nobody was able to vote. Uh, I found some photos of the actual time period where there was a car this deep in the mud and people shoveling it out and they're saying like, oh, that's So, uh, he obviously lost, his votes weren't there, but then um, he runs again and wins his second election. And that was another similarity they both had. Um, written, 
or he would have his attorney general dig one up, which it was very coercive and manipulative. I mean, there were bribes being done. Uh, I mean, his indictment actually, when they tried to impeach him, the both Willie and Huey are also impeached. Again, Willie's path follows the same kind of, he just ends up being more coercive, trying to blackmail people. Uh, Jack Burton, the narrator, ends up being more or less, because he's a historian by heart and nature, but he has his career in journalism and is essentially a muckraker, but then turns all of his loyalties to Willie, and so he essentially becomes Willie's muckraker for other politicians. Uh, okay, so yeah, um, some of the, the charges that they were actually was bribed and attempted to bribe legislators and use coercive measures. When they first indicted Huey Long, uh, they had 19 different charges in the House and only eight went over to the Senate for guilty or innocent. But, and this is just kind of funny, one of the 19 charges that he had, he was accused of going to a drunken party where half-naked women danced the hula, and that's in court documents. <laughs> so, again, you know, I don't know if necessarily a politician would get in trouble for something like that nowadays. Probably just wouldn't look good when he goes to church the next time. But it's, um, they said the same, they said the same kind of things about Willie, that he was a womanizer and scandalous, and there are some similarities in that too. I mean, they have, uh, they both have affairs with co-workers, they both manipulate the, the status of their family members to get into power. Okay, and uh, just to give you a little bit more about his legacy, is he really, he was a complicated man. I wouldn't say he was totally evil, but Okay, so by 1936, the infrastructure program begun by Long had completed 9,700 miles of roads from 300. He employed 10% of the entire, I want to say this right, nation's highway workers during the Great Depression in Louisiana. I mean, the stuff that he was able to accomplish in the Great Depression, when there were people in, I read in Kentucky, an entire coal community what was completely without jobs. There was nobody with jobs in this town. They survived off of wild blackberries and dandelions in the Great Depression. I mean, some of the stories you would hear from these towns, there was uh, reports in the news of 50 men being arrested because they were fighting over a barrel of trash for food. So uh, the fact that he was able to accomplish all of this and with such progressive uh, stamina and dedication is really impressive, uh, and they say that, okay, spoiler, they both are assassinated, both and in their real life, uh, but before he was assassinated, he was actually even considering a run against FDR in the 1936 presidential election, and his threat, like the Green Party threatened Gore, or Teddy threatened uh, Taft, it was, he was saying, you know, if if he hadn't been there threatening to run against FDR, being even more progressive, even more to the left, then the New Deal wouldn't have even been anywhere close to as progressive. We, I mean, and they covered Social Security, 40-hour work week, uh, weekends, uh, unions, the, I mean, there, there's way too much to list right now. But his program was called Share Our Wealth, and it was a way more extreme version. And so I don't keep anyone here any longer. If you'd like details on that, we can go to the email later. We can do the rest of my slides. Okay, the constituents, again, they're populist in the sense that they were the individualistic, the rural folk who just felt disenfranchised. They had no one to cling to. They were just waiting for someone to come and save them. And Willie was that guy. The boss is how they refer to Willie. He just starts out as this genuinely, you think he really just means it on every fiber of his being that he is a good guy and he's going to try and fight the good fight, but then it's like he gets there and he's like, you're not going to fight fair, I'm going to fight even less fair. So then the Delta is what they call the elite, the people who lived around uh, essentially the Mississippi River Delta, um, and then Jack Burton's our narrator, that whole novel, and he comes from the Delta and ends up siding with uh, Willis Stark, and it shows that Populism will be effective 
if an aristocrat like Jack were to bend down, or if a populist like Huey, uh, Willie or Huey Long were able to climb up. And that's why it's awesome, and there's no way I'm trying to show you these books. Questions for Heather. Southern agrarians. So, how does his philosophy of the agrarians kind of uh, work in this work as you're talking about? It seems um, to have some of those features, but it also seems to be a big twist on that. But what do you mean, agrarian? What elaborate on that part first? I'm not following. Do, are, are you aware of the Southern agrarians at all? And his, his issue that might be just something then later that you might look into just with, with Robert Van Warren. He's literally known as real famous as being one of the Southern agrarians. And they came out of Vanderbilt and uh, had a special idea of what the South, as you keep calling the rustics and, and things, the Southern rustics, and what role that that needed to play in um, the survival of, of, of America's culture of things. And so you might want to take a look at it. It might be kind of cool for you to see how that plays out. Um, I think we, I, I mean, I have a lot more history. I just really don't want to bore you with a bunch of the details. I <laughs> but um, I, do, I do think they touched on some of that, but mostly all of my work was focusing on Huey and his actual constituents. Uh -huh. I haven't really looked into much of his history other than his academic work. to this research topic? Okay. I, to be quite honest, had no real idea how I wanted to come up with a double major English and political science, and I knew coming to McNair, it was awesome because we could pick whatever we wanted, and I really want a class to exist that teaches literature and politics. There's uh, politics and film, there's literature and film. I feel that I could combine all three of these and I actually found a layout for the class from some guy in the 80s and I tried to send it to this professor to get him to make it because I'm not a professor and I can't. So, <laughs> yet. <laughs> so, that was kind of what it is. I just like books and politics and, I mean, that old black and white film Robert Crawford was actually really good. And yeah, 
So Heather, you might be like Dr. Diaz, right? Mm -hmm. Well, and that's what I was kind of talking about with Daddy at lunch. So I was like, it's really cool. Like, what I wanted didn't really exist because I wanted to talk about the book. I wanted to show why it's important to use novels to teach certain uh, like political doctrine, philosophies of life. I mean, you can take a book and enjoy it and then get the deeper meaning out of it and still walk away with something that resonates far deeper than me droning on about the, like, if I just gave you the Wikipedia of populism, like, this is way more interesting. He really wants a character. So I just feel like it, it, it helps to use one of our GRA words, elucidate. So years from now, <laughs> they elucidate their real <laughs> motives because these people weren't, they, he was so confident.